So today, what I kind of wanted to do first was just see if you guys had any questions. I would love to review what we talked about in January, but that is a lot of stuff. So if you guys have any questions on that, we will be kind of overlapping uh, because that's just how horticulture is. Um, so we're going to do that. We're going to talk a little bit just overall kind of plant growth and development. Um, and then actually, I should have pulled this up. And then I actually had on today light intensity and quality. We'll probably do that tomorrow. Okay. Um, um, but we're going to kind of focus today heavily on uh, nutrients. And um, I didn't add a slide, which I, I was reminded when Rick said something about organic fertilizers. Uh, I want to talk to you about what I've learned um, in the last uh, six months about that, which is some groundbreaking stuff. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about water usage throughout the plant, how that functions, maybe not in that same order. And then I'd like to get out in the garden and take a look at a few things. So I'll kind of, um, not so much in the presentation, but when we get out in the garden, I'll kind of give you guys a little um, peek into my brain, how I function when I'm working with clients, um, whether it's on a golf course, whether it's anywhere on how I diagnose plants, right? Um, and what I need to do to figure out the problems, okay? So we'll go, we'll go into that. So that'll be kind of a fun little thing to do. And what I'd like to do is kind of go in and, and maybe Kathy can help us on this. If there's certain trees that are struggling, um, I'm not looking for the right answer. We're just looking for something that we can kind of practice and, and kind of do. Um, and what we'll do, maybe we'll break off into a couple different groups and have two people kind of figure out, look at one tree and say, okay, what's, what's wrong with this tree? Or what's the problems, what's its ailments? Um, and then we'll and then we'll kind of go back to you and say, okay, what do you guys what do you guys come up with, kind of a thing, okay? So um, and then for tomorrow we'll talk a little, probably about light intensity and quality, uh, seasonal transitions and dormancy. It's important right now. This is the end of the summer. As we're getting through summer, we're still getting those hot days, um, but shorter days, okay? And how do you know what happens with the plant in that regard? And then. Um, also a little bit on just aftercare, we might touch on that a little bit today, but also tomorrow, because this is the time of year where a lot of work happens on certain species of trees, especially junipers, um, and how do, we, how do we manage that? And then also, I wanna talk about this concept, I'll briefly touch on it. It may be a long conversation, but there's a, a concept of health and what we consider ultimate health, okay? And so um, we'll talk about that, which is kind of interesting. And this is something that um, Ryan Neal uh, teaches very heavily, but also it's something in the landscape and horticulture industry that's, that's really coming on strong, okay? And it's very similar if you wanna compare it to something to holistic medicine for um, the medical industry and for human health, okay? So very simple, similar to that, all right? Any questions so far? And we're gonna get the slides right Yeah, what I'll do is, uh, and I might even, maybe even tonight if I find some time, um, which I may or may not hope. You, I heard you guys have really good trees. I'm excited to see them. So, but uh, um, I'm going to try to, if we've talked about something and it was in the slide, I'll try to kind of throw something in there so you guys can remember. But definitely take notes. I'm a big fan of taking notes um, because even if I never read them again, for some reason when I'm writing them, it helps to kind of inscribe it into my brain. But okay, so I, I don't know if this is accurate. Uh, probably not. Nope, it's an old one. So. Okay, um, you guys know who I am. And just want to remind you of this principle here, right? Or this, this concept that, um, that I kind of developed and then as I've spent more time um, in the industry and spent more time doing bonsai and working with clients and consulting, um, this has, has continued to be reinforced and backed up as I um, look at new things. And really what it is is kind of goes into what Kathy was saying about microclimates, how difficult it is to figure out or to tell someone, especially like Kathy has numerous students all over the United States that have very, very different climates. How do you tell them, you know, how do you dictate to them what they need to do for even the same species of tree, okay? Um, and really it's, it's this thing. So there are certain principles that really never change, right? And so example principle, trees need water, okay? But a practice would be watering every morning, okay? Well, that practice may change depending on who you are. Maybe if you're in a very foggy situation, you wait a little bit to water your trees until maybe a little bit in the afternoon when that cloud cover is broken. So practices will change all the time, okay? And if you can kind of wrap your head around that concept that, hey, practices are gonna change, so 
what is the principle that is being reinforced with a certain practice, then you can take whatever anyone else says and apply it to your own personal situation, right? Okay. Um, and so, and then that also avoids the, I've seen a lot of, you know, lectures or been in demos or whatever and someone says, oh, you do this and someone goes, no, 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 that doesn't work at my house. And it's like, well, we didn't ask you, but you're right. It probably doesn't work at your house, but we're not here to say what's right and what's wrong because that's really not what horticulture is. There's advantages and disadvantages, but there's no right or wrong answers, unfortunately. And this is the whole reason, okay? So any questions on this concept here? Okay. So um, I'm the only one who's actually articulated this concept that I know of um, in horticulture, but I think a lot of people constantly are trying to say this, but not in this, in this term, right? And, okay. And obviously, if you guys feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose today, just tell me to stop and we can take it easy, okay? Um, a, along with this, uh, there's that, I don't know if I told you guys this last time, but there's a really good quote that I like, and it says, the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure, so I like to take breaks. Um, however, for some reason, that ends up being every hour and a half, and I just read a new study that um, your attention span is correlated with your age. So. For example, for me, I'm in my mid-30s. I should only be able to pay attention for about 30 minutes, right? That's not necessarily true, but that's kind of a good broad spectrum thing. So maybe we should take a minute, a break every 45 minutes or something like that to help us, okay? And um, so, yeah, and if you have any questions, please just ask me and we'll have kind of a discussion. What's nice about having a small group like this is I can learn as much from you guys and vice versa as you can from me as we kind of discuss and talk about different things and different concepts, okay? All right, any questions about that? We're good? Okay. Um, we did the anatomy of trees. Okay, we'll talk a little about how trees grow. Okay, a little about photosynthesis. Uh, pretty in-depth on water and very in-depth on nutrients. Okay, uh, not too much on tree types. That's not r really important today. But um, pruning and really what I want to talk about pruning, I want to get into a little bit on... Um, on hormones, we talked about it with roots last time. Very, very similar, okay, but what happens with um, branches is that your key players, as far as your hormones, those concentrations are kind of a mirror image as you get above the soil, okay? Um, not so important with um, what hormones are what in bonsai, but just figuring out okay, I'm going to do this and it's going to cause a shift in hormones and this is how the plant's going to respond. That's important, okay? Um, and then I wanted to talk about, uh, and I don't know if I did, did I touch on using cut paste in the last session? No. No, okay. Um, I don't, I'm not saying you should use cut paste or you shouldn't. I use it all the time. But I want to talk about um, one reason that Walter Paul says no to cut paste, okay? Um, and kind of, what cutting kind of does. And I, there was this tree that I walked by every day for three years when I was in grad school. And it was this perfect example of the different ways we prune trees in bonsai and kind of um, what happens after a few years of growth. Okay. All right. And then questions and answers all day long. Okay. We went over this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but if just so you know, if I start to refer to the tree, a certain part of the tree, this is kind of my terminology, right? So we have the crown of the tree, the apex, um, or it could be called the canopy, right? We have the trunk, and there's a base or the crown of the trunk. Sometimes um, in horticulture books, or if you buy a disease book, it'll say oh, the tree's got crown rot. Well, that just means it's, it's rotting down in here. There's too much water um, above the nabari, really, okay? And it's getting rot down in this area, okay? Um, but then there's roots, right? So we have surface roots, structural and fine feeder roots, which we went into pretty heavily in January, okay? So that's that. All right, and then we went into this too. This is important, especially right now, this time of the year, to remember, to be reminded of what's the structure of the branch? What's the structure of the trunk, okay? So we have, you know, this outer area, this outer bark, okay? And um, if, you'll look in, if you look in other books and other textbooks, you'll, it'll be called, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's not the, 
Anyways, I, I missed that. But anyways, this portion here, this is the cortex, okay? And then there's another portion. There's several layers of the bark, okay? Um, well, then beneath that, we have the most important part here, which is the vascular cambium, okay? The, what's important about the vascular cambium, if you guys remember, do you guys remember what happens in the vascular cambium? You guys may have remembered this term from if you've taken any classes on um, grafting, right? The vascular cambium, that's the spot you want to connect with your scion or your, um, yeah, okay, that's where the growth happens. Well, what specifically, right? So does that mean that this doesn't grow and this doesn't grow? Yeah, so this grows this way and this way. Once this phloem is developed, it doesn't really grow anymore. These cells don't divide. They differentiate, they change, okay? But they don't divide. This is where the cellular division happens. So the cells are made for the xylem and the phloem from this point, and then they kind of go outwards like that. And then as this continues to grow and develop, those cells differentiate and they change, and then they move outward, okay? Outward and inward, all right? So the vascular cambium, that is where all of the cellular division takes place on the trunk or branch, okay? And it's generally just one cell layer thick. It's very, very thin, very, very thin layer. Um, and uh, bark beetles love to feed on that layer, okay? Actually, I don't even think they like to feed on that layer. I think they like to feed on the phloem, but that vascular cambium layer is so thin that they cannot possibly feed on the phloem without damaging the, the cambium, okay? Um, so, anyways, it's a very important part of the branch, okay? And then you have, this is the sapwood. The sapwood is basically a term that means this year's xylem that's developed, okay? That's the sapwood. And then you have inner portions of the, of the tree, of the xylem, um, which is still conducting water. And then in some trees you'll have, uh, most conifers, you'll have heartwood, okay? And that heartwood will stop conducting water and generally be filled with sap to try to prevent um, decay, okay? So, um, and then you have really the pith, which doesn't exist in large mature trees or even small mature trees because um, it's kind of developed and it's so small at this point, it's gone. So just a reminder, the phloem is sugar and energy, photosynthates, and we'll talk about that a little bit probably tomorrow, a little bit more, and today in the garden, okay? Um, and then the xylem is water and nutrients, okay? Generally, the xylem will move the water from the roots up, okay? And nutrients from the roots up. And then the, sorry, and then the phloem will move sugar um, and energy any way it needs it, okay? And we'll talk about that today as well. Any questions on that? We're good? Okay, so this is review, right? Uh, how do trees grow? What do they need? They need light, they need water, okay. They need air, what specifically in the air? Carbon dioxide, okay. What about roots? What do they need? What type of air, what type of gas? Uh, not exactly, they do take up nitrogen as a nutrient. They need oxygen, okay. So there we have our two main players as far as in the, in the gaseous form is carbon dioxide and oxygen. So we talk about air, we talk about carbon dioxide and oxygen, okay? The 70% um, composition of air that is nitrogen is really not available for plants until we get a rainfall and that um, nitrogen can mix with water and then come down into the soil. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, and that's how uh, nitrogen is fixed from the air with a lot of different different ways in the environment. Actually, not a lot, about three or four different ways, okay? Anyway, so they need light, they need water, they need air, okay? And then uh, Janet kept saying nitrogen, and they do need nutrients, okay? So those, those are those things. Let's see if we got them all, okay? Those are those. So that's what they need. So we just have to kind of always keep that kind of in, you know, our right in front of our face to remember, okay, what do they need, what do they need? A lot of times, um, I've seen a lot of people, um, especially in very hot environments, I had a discussion with, I wanna say it was David Wee. Anyways, he has a lot of clients in Arizona. Well, it gets really hot in Arizona, okay? And um, so they put shade cloths up for everything. And one of the biggest problems they have, which they don't realize, is lack of sunlight on their trees, 
well, they got tons of sun. Well, it's so hot that they um, are always trying to keep them in the shade and then their trees are suffering because it's super hot and they're not getting enough sunlight. Okay, so that's, that's a big problem. I had the same problem with um, a friend of mine who, or another client who's actually passed away, but um, he had a lot of heat in his yard and so he went and purchased shade cloth from like Home Depot or Lowe's and it blocks out like 80% of the sunlight and a lot of his junipers were suffering. He said, I don't know what the deal is. I'm feeding them and, and it's like, well, they're not getting enough light. It doesn't matter how, many nutrient, how much nutrients you give them and how, mu how well you water them, they're just not getting enough light. Yep. Ooh, yeah, it's not on there, is it? Oh, but we will talk about it. Temperature is important, okay? So why is temperature important? Or let me put it this way. How would temperature be important in growth for trees? Okay. Yeah, okay. So temperature, if we were to look at it with a graph or something like that, okay, the higher the temperature gets, the faster uh, metabolic or um, I guess you could say biogeochem or biochemical reactions, they, they happen at a faster rate, okay? But when it gets too hot, what happens? They get stifled. Yep. And when it gets too cold, what happens? They get stifled. Same deal, okay? So they kind of have this window, right? So a, an appropriate temperature range is, is, is necessary for, um, for trees to grow. Um, I didn't put that probably because you can get trees that are growing in the tundra. Um, and then, oh, sorry, taiga, right? Tundra is like no trees. Is that correct? I don't know. I haven't learned that since like grade school. It's like sixth grade. Anyone, anybody know? Tundra is no trees, right? Very low shrubs, um, if any. And then the taiga, big, huge coniferous forest, right? But still freezing cold. And then you have trees in the tropics, and they still seem to grow, right? Okay. Um, but... Huh? Different. different trees, very, very, very true. But the, the concept of the warmer it gets, the more trees grow, for sure, until a certain point. Okay? Yeah, Kathy. Um, just go over that one little section about the Home Depot shade cloth. Again? Oh, I will. Yeah. Uh, if I forget, remind me. Yeah. That Home Depot shade cloth is meant for, for humans not to get sunburned. It is not meant for trees to... to to be kept under them. Yeah, and that's a big deal. It's funny, there's this, there's this um, parking structure that uh, is just down the street from my house and I walk my dogs by it every morning and it's just the whole thing, um, it's lined with junipers, the whole parking structure, okay? And there's just this one row where there's just huge trees because if you've been in downtown Sacramento, there's just trees everywhere. Um, and it's just super shaded. That's my biggest problem in Sacramento is, I mean, it's 105 degrees, but full shade. It's kind of weird. But uh, anyways, um, there's this whole line of junipers and they've been there for probably 30, 40 years because they're old and they have like no foliage on them. They're just super, just, and they have tons of spider mites and all this stuff. And, and the biggest problem is they just do not get enough light. And then it's funny because you'll look around the corner and you'll see this whole row of junipers and they're just huge big bushes because they're getting tons of light. And so light is a big problem. A lot of people don't realize it, but you know, I can go in and go, hey, what's the problem? Okay, here, and then go, oh, it's light. Um, and I kind of developed this skill over the years, but this was a big deal for me. I had a professor in college and he used to give his lectures or he used to give his exams like this. He would have nothing, he would have just a question up there that says, what's wrong with this tree? And he'd have a picture, and that's it. And he'd go to the next one. 60 of them like that, boom, 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 boom. And we'd have one hour, 60 seconds on every, on every picture. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing ever. But I learned a lot because he helped me to kind of figure out how do I diagnose things. And there was one that I got wrong on the final and I just couldn't figure it out. I thought, you know what, the picture, by the picture, it looks like it's got enough light. Um, it could be a nutrient deficiency, but the nutrients, it, it didn't seem to look like anything I could really pinpoint. I thought, if anything, it just didn't get enough nitrogen because it just looked like it was all kind of declining. And I thought, man, what is it? And I didn't notice, but the soil underneath the tree was a little bit disturbed. And so I went up to him afterwards and I said, what, what was that? You know, it's the one I missed. 
And um, I knew I missed that one, and he, uh, and he said, well, let's take a look at it, and he showed me the picture. And I just kind of went through, I said, it's got enough sunlight, it doesn't look like any real nutrient deficiency, um, and, you know, oh, it's a subtropical tree, so it's probably in a good place, or whatever it is. And then he said, well, did you look at the soil? And I said, well, what am I gonna tell from the soil? And he's like, there's gopher mounds all over that. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? And he's like, yeah, so the answer was gophers. And I just wanted to strangle him. I just, I was, I just went crazy. But I learned a lot from that experience, but I'll never forget that. So he was like, yeah, that's the problem with that tree, gophers, right? So the gophers were just completely decimating the root system, just couldn't get enough water, right? So very interesting, right? So um, we'll kind of go over a little bit of that today. Okay, so uh, photosynthesis, when I was in, this is kind of what I studied in grad school, was really photosynthesis. Um, I got to a point where I, had somebody asked me, I was taking a class, and they said, oh, have you learned about photosynthesis yet? And I said, oh, yeah. And they said, okay, how many times? I said, uh, I had it in biology, like 101 or something like that, and I had it in high school, obviously, and then I had it in a plant physiology class, and I had it in horticulture. And then, this was when I was in grad school, and then the professor looked at me, and they said, well, we better teach you a little bit about photosynthesis then. I thought, oh gosh, here it comes. And so I, the next three years, I was learning about photosynthesis, and it got to the point where I just realized, um, I just don't want to learn anymore. I don't care. <laughs> I don't want to know anymore about it. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot to know about photosynthesis, but for our intents and purposes, very simple process, but the most important thing, or there, there are a few key components in there, okay? Um, and really, it's, it's all of this, okay? Light air, water, and nutrients. That's the whole basis of whole growth and development, right? And this changes throughout the year. It goes up, it goes down. Sometimes it flips upside down depending on the heat, especially with grasses. But anyway, so photosynthesis is important, okay? And so you guys can look at this um, little diagram here. We get water coming in from the roots, okay? And then going up through the plant and then exiting through the leaves. This is just a little, like, I don't know, soybean or something like that. And then we have oxygen going into the roots and oxygen and carbon dioxide coming out of the roots, uh, but then above the soil we have carbon dioxide going into the leaves and then oxygen going out, okay? So down here, um, I like to think of the soil line kind of like a mirror, right? So things are functioning very, very similarly underneath the soil, but it's just like the flip side of it, okay? Just like a 180 degree turn, okay? Just like a mirror image, so that's important. All right, so if you wanna look at photosynthesis, this is kind of a really basic, um, uh, formula, but basically you have your carbon dioxide, you have some water, actually a lot of water, you have light, and not, uh, depends on how much, uh, light is different for every, every plant, and then you get some sugar and some oxygen as a byproduct, okay, and that sugar is used for energy to drive other processes in the plant. So you have your carbon dioxide, and there's your oxygen there, and then you have your water, okay? And so this is how, this is where oxygen comes from in this process, okay? So oxygen, you have oxygen in the glucose and you have oxygen also in as a byproduct. Well, that comes from the CO2 and the um, H2O. And what happens in the plant, you have H2O coming up from the roots, okay? And then it works its way up into the leaves and that H2O, okay, some of it is leaving the leaf to kind of work as like air conditioning. You can think of it as like an, like an evapor, what is it, um, a swamp cooler or something like that, okay, evaporation cooling. So 85%, something like that, the majority of all water is used for cooling the plant, okay. Um, but the rest of it is used uh, mainly for photosynthesis. And so um, the light responds to, um, or that light activates um, and changes the state of an electron, okay and that electron gets what we call excited. It gets excited and there's a lot of energy in there and that's, how, that's where the light plays a role. Light basically transfers the energy to that electron and that electron's excited and then that electron moves along what we call electron transport chain and that um, kind of processes a lot of the other um, uh, things throughout photosynthesis. So um, the way, where does that electron come from that gets excited? It comes from water. So water comes up into the leaf and then that light hits and it basically excites an electron and an electron is taken off of water by splitting water from the hydrogen and the hydrogen, there's an electron that comes off of hydrogen and it leaves hydrogen as H plus and then 
um, and then water is just uh, just an O, but or sorry, um, oxygen is just an O, a single oxygen um, atom, and then but oxygen has a high affinity for itself, so it will grab onto another oxygen and become O2. Okay, at that point, and then that's just left. So that's where that oxygen comes from. Comes from water, and then when we get through the electron transport chain, there's another process called um, uh, you can call it the dark reactions or light independent reactions, the Calvin cycle, and that's where carbon dioxide is fixed. And during that process, carbon dioxide is fixed, and the oxygen is also cleaved off. Okay, and um, that, and then you have that as a byproduct as well. Okay, so that makes sense. So the oxygen comes from your carbon dioxide and from your water. Okay. Any other questions on that? I have actually a really interesting little video if you guys want to see it in our spare in our spare time that kind of goes over photosynthesis a little bit pretty, pretty well. And if someone else were to ask you, well, what is it? Well, it's air, water, sh air, water, and light equals sugar and oxygen, okay? Um, just to remember, trees are autotrophic. This is something I like to remind people about, and this is kind of my thing, like uh, Kathy was saying, could you remind so-and-so or remind them about that shade cloth at Lowe's or Home Depot? This is my deal. Um, plants are autotrophs, okay? Or and more specifically, they're phototrophs. So they feed themselves through the energy that they gain from light, okay? So basically, if you were to try to say what photosynthesis is, it's the process of converting light energy into chemical energy, okay? Um, so plants feed themselves through light. So when people say, oh, I, I gotta go feed my plant, and I'll say it all the time, okay? I gotta go feed, uh, you know, all oh, this plant, give it some food, feed it heavily. Well, we're really not feeding the plant. We can't detect, we can't really control that. The plant feeds itself. Well, but we can give it nutrients to help supplement its growth, okay? And that's what, that's what fertilizers are. But, so it's important to understand that. And if we understand that, they feed themselves through light, maybe we'll connect the dots and realize that if we put it under 85% shade cloth, you're not gonna get a very happy plant, okay? Okay, um, let's talk about water. All right, so we have H2O, okay. Uh, we talked about this when we uh, went into capillary action, how water moves through the soil, okay. Do you guys remember that? Did we talk about that? Every particle of water, molecule of water, uh -huh. is connected to every other molecule. Yes, yes, what's that if called? It's not, it's then steam or vapor or something. R right, so water likes to stick to itself. It's very polar, right? Um, and also other things. Cohesion, okay, so that's that property, cohesion. And then when it sticks to something else, okay, oops, it's called adhesion, okay? So you have cohesion and adhesion. So that's very important to realize with water. Water will do that, okay? And this is how, it's funny, because this simple concept is really how water gets 300 feet up in the air through the coastal redwoods, okay? And it's a li literally a continuous chain of water. And if that chain of water breaks because there's a drought response, then, um, and there's air filled in the xylem, that's actually another problem that um, it's called xylem cavitation. And uh, I'm actually, yeah, it's pretty interesting. So basically making a big air pocket, like, like a cave inside um, this cell that's supposed to be full of water, okay? And I um, have a, a colleague who studied that at UC Riverside, um, actually a professor of mine, and um, he studied that in Oaks, actually. And so I'm not sure if you guys have um, seen on Coast Live Oaks uh, specifically, sometimes you'll get kind of flagging, or you'll get a little, like, you just get a leaf that just dies on you, okay, here or there. That happens in Southern California all the time. It's because of that drought. Oaks do that naturally. Uh, and what happens is it gets a little bit too hot and they'll get an embolism in their, um, their xylem and that embolism will travel up and then as soon as it gets to where the leaf is, there's no water for that leaf and that leaf fries, boom, okay. So where that embolism travels, it's kind of like, it's like uh, you know, air in the bloodstream, right? So wherever it goes and then it will, you'll lose that leaf or that branch or something like that. That's, that's my theory on why we get kind of random little branch dieback on oaks, okay? They're very susceptible to embolisms, okay? All right, so cohesion, adhesion, that works as a gradient, okay? So we've talked about osmosis. I'm sure you guys have heard that, 
All right, osmosis is a very big thing when we talk about water in the soil and then nutrients and all that stuff. Okay, but um, water just kind of acts this way. It's, a, it's one of the other characteristics. When there's lots of water, it likes to go where the other water is, okay? And that is not only just the actual concentration of water, but that um, may be how water is in relation to maybe a salt or something like that. So if you had really salty water, you have pure water, and you put them in like next to each other and there's like a kind of a membrane where water can pass through, okay, that's going to equal, equal out where the water is going to move from the very fresh water area into the salty water, okay? Um, and then the other thing is if water, um, even if you take like a, a glass of water, okay, that water starts to evaporate, well, there's a chain there. There's more water in the cup and there's less water in the air and even less water further up in the air where the wind's moving and so that is evaporating and moving its way up very similar to what happens in trees okay so water actually is it's a passive thing for the most part there's no energy um, that's required for water to move through the plant okay um, and so that's very important to think about because um, sometimes someone can go oh well maybe my plant it needs some help with water, so I'm going to give a little bit of fertilizer to give it a little bit more energy. Well, no, 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 no that's not what we want to do. If you have a problem with your plant's roots and water moving through the plant, you just, you manage it what I call culturally. You do something different. You tip the pot up, you put in a little bit of shade, you don't water it or you water it, whatever it may be, you missed it, you do whatever, but you don't try to give it anything else that requires energy because that's not what happens, okay? So when I talk about it doesn't require energy, I mean it doesn't require the plant's physical energy that it generates through photosynthesis. There is some energy transfer if you're a physics major, but yeah, okay. So that's that, okay? So water's transported through the xylem. That's kind of the process as we've been looking up here. It goes roots, shoots, leaves into the air, and it can flip over on itself, okay? Especially if you get into a microclimate where you have higher humidity in the air than you do in the pot, okay? Um, that can happen. Shouldn't happen with your bonsai, but it can happen in a natural um, setting. Okay. How many of you have ever seen this? I saw this for years and years and years. This is a nostalgic image to me. It looks like really confusing, right? Okay, well, this is kind of what happens when we're looking at trees. Okay. So you look at here, this is what we call water potential. Okay, this little. Uh, symbol there, it's called psi, I think. I think it's a Greek letter. Um, anyways, that is your potential. All right. So as we look here, this is the unit. It's called megapascals. Okay. Um, and basically what it is, it's pressure. So if we look here in the soil, we have still a negative pressure. Okay. If we don't have a negative pressure, that means it's like literally solid water. Okay. This would have a pressure of zero if you were inside this water. All right. So the soil should have some air in it, so it's going to have a negative pressure, so, but it's negative 0.3. As we get into the trunk, it's more negative, negative 0.6, okay? Further in the trunk, negative 0.8. Up in the leaves, negative 1. Okay, well now we're at 1 megapascal. Um, and then at the, in the leaf air spaces, so inside the leaf, up into this area over here, if we look kind of in this little white area, it's even drier, okay? So um, what happens, water will be pulled from the cell itself into this air space. And then from that air space, we'll go into the outside air, where it's a negative, negative 100 megapascals. Okay, so there's a lot of negative pressure, okay, or negative megapascals, a lot of pressure in the atmosphere, and that's what's the driving force for pulling water through the plant, okay? So there is a lot of energy, just not energy that the plant needs to utilize, okay? And that's how it functions. Yeah, okay, so basically here, you have less pressure in the soil. Basically, what does that mean? There's more water in the soil. Pressure inside, outside, um, from to I think a good way to look at it uh, is to think the space between the water molecules. How about that? There's less space between water molecules. They're closer together when they're in the soil. And then the more tension Okay, the more space between them, the higher the pressure becomes. So the pascal is in the pressure to, to coat. Yeah, it's like a tension. It's more like a tension, okay. So your air, it, there's water in the air, right? There's vapor in the air, but it's very far apart, okay. 
and it's kind of floating around. Well, when it's in a liquid form, it's very close together. Okay, and so there's less pressure there because everything's just kind of. Um, uh huh. Four water molecules. Okay, and we're looking at this. Okay, and really it's that tension. Okay. So if you look at it here, the soil water. There's more water molecules. They're closer together, and then in the air, there's fewer mo water molecules. They're very far apart. And so that's why water moves through the plants and up through the air. Okay? And then water will also be evaporated from the surface here. And it's literally this is chain and just goes all the way up. Okay? And so these root hairs are in the soil, as we talked about, and there's water in the soil between these soil particles. The root hairs pick up those water molecules. They move through these cells into the next cell and the next one, and then they go right into the xylem. And it's just like a straw, and it just starts going up all the way up into there goes from the xylem and it travels from different xylem cells back and forth all the way up into the leaves, okay? From the leaves, from the leaves, and then out to the atmosphere. Any other questions on that? Is this helpful at all to see this diagram? Okay, sometimes it's a little bit too much jargon. Is that why it's yeah. good that there's always a breeze? Yeah. It helps the water to move? Uh-huh, it does. So I always had a love-hate relationship with with wind. I loved wind when I had a tree that didn't dry out very fast. I'm just like, man, I don't want that water to sit in the soil. Well, the wind helped it to evaporate a little bit more and helped water to pull through the plant. Um, but I hated wind if I had just wired a tree or stressed a tree out and um, then the wind would pull water through the plant a little bit too fast. Okay, so um, that was kind of a deal. But it's very important to have wind. One, I was telling you an example of uh, my friend that had that shade cloth from Home Depot. He had two problems. The first problem was the shade cloth didn't uh, let enough light in. The second problem, his shade cloth was too low. So he had a fence and he put the shade cloth right at the fence level. It was like six feet high. And so some of his trees are almost touching the shade cloth. Uh, and there wasn't any air movement underneath there. So now he had very little light, very little air movement. So a lot of his things stayed stayed wet a little too long, but also there wasn't carbon dioxide coming in and replenishing. So the plants were starving for carbon dioxide, really, and light, okay? And so that was really interesting. So it's important that there's always some kind of a breeze. And you'll notice you can put a juniper inside and give it tons of light. It's not gonna do as well if, it does, if it's outside, okay? It needs some of that movement. My wife, she loves plants, and she always wants to have indoor plants. And I told her, well, you know, we've, in our other house that we had purchased in Riverside, um, we had a good window, but that was about it. You know, but then every other house we lived in, we lived in, it just didn't work out. Well, um, anyways, my big, my theory on why indoor plants do so poorly is because of lack of light and lack of air movement. That's it. So, first of all, you're not getting enough light, and the little light you do get, you're not getting enough carbon dioxide. Okay, and so you want you want that to be moving. All right. And then you get problems with the roots if you water it too heavily, and then now it's not drying out, all these problems, okay? So we went over nutrients the last time. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take it one step further, maybe two or three steps, but if it's too much, just let me know. Um, and I will give you a fair warning. I am learning a lot about n nutrients now and how they function in soils. I got a book that's supposedly really good. It just came in the mail the other day. I haven't read it yet. It's called The Art of Balancing Nutrients in Soil. Okay. Um, and I should have brought it, but I figured we would be partying all night at Janet and Rick's. I wouldn't have any time to read. So um, anyway, so uh, I've been learning a lot about, about nutrients and how it works in soil. Uh, obviously different in bonsai uh, soils and in, and in pots, but you know everything kind of transfers if you can f pick out what the principles are and then kind of not get confused with the practices, right? Okay. So we have nutrients, okay? There's lots of them. So what are nutrients? They're basically essential el elements. So there's 17 nutrients that are essential for plants to complete their life cycle, okay? Um, so you can have a plant that doesn't have a certain nutrient or is, um, but it will not be able to complete its life cycle, okay? So these nutrients are essential for plants to do everything that they need to do, right? Okay, um, there it is. Cannot complete their life cycle without it, all right? Um, and the other thing is it cannot be replaced with another nutrient, okay? If there's a magnesium or, sorry, a manganese ion 
inside the chlorophyll molecule, there's actually four of them, um, you can't replace manganese with magnesium. It doesn't work that way, okay? Um, so, is that? <laughs> anyway, so you can't replace these. So you have to make sure that these are there, okay? So that's basically what means by, that's what it means by essential elements, okay? And so we have, and we'll go over this in depth, but we have 17 essential elements. Some of them are macro and some of them are micro. Macro meaning they're in higher concentrations in healthy leaf tissue and micro meaning they're very small concentrations, okay? All right, um, when, we, when we look at fertilizers, uh, there's generally what we call a fertilizer analysis. Another term is fertilizer grade, and there's three numbers on there. If you get a bag of um, uh, miracle Grow, you'll see, you know, it's 16, 16, 16, or something like that, or it's 2108, something like that, all right? Um, and if you're getting an organic, you're looking at something like 545. Five. Okay, and that's really the percent concentration of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. And to be more specific, it's actually not phosphorus, it's um, uh, P2O4, and then potassium, it's K2O, okay. Um, but that's getting to a little, a little bit too much. So that's the percent of what we're, are considered major nutrients. This N, P, and K, they are the, the nutrients that are in highest concentration in the plant and therefore the most limiting factor when some of them is lost, okay? So that's what's really important for those. Um, but micronutrients are becoming, um, are, are gaining importance in the horticulture world because a lot of people are forgetting them. And you have systems or you have plants and some of these golf courses, it's interesting because the more I work with golf courses, the more I liken it to bonsai, maybe it's just my brain because it's weird, but some of these courses have been around for 100 years and I'm asking, well, when's the last time you rebuilt your greens? Like, and the last time you seeded? They're like, we haven't. We haven't seeded for 100 years. It's like, wow, well, that grass didn't live for 100 years, but there's some grass there, and it's seeding, and it's, it's going. So they're, con they're continuously maintaining this golf course putting green for a long time, okay? And how do we, how do we um, you know, what do we do there? Well, um, it's important to know what's happening in the soils to keep them going, okay? Um, all right, so that's that. Your micronutrients, these are them, those are macro. These are what are in higher concentration. The highest concentration would probably be, oop, there's one more, I think. Yep, these are in your highest concentration right here, but where does, where does the plant get these? You got carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. We don't fertilize with these, do we? Yeah, they get it from the air and from water, okay? So we do, technically, if we let them get enough air, if we cut some holes in that fence, all right? We can say, hey, we gotta cut holes in the fence to fertilize our trees. They're like, what are you talking about? Yes, yeah, so the CO2, it's all out there, it's not in here, okay? Um, and then the hydrogen's from the water, okay? So these are in the highest concentration right here because you take these out of the plant and it's like a dead branch. You still have all these in, in them, okay? And the nitrogen will leave eventually, yeah? If you get a fertilizer that's like 16, 16, 16, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The proportions seem the same. Is it just higher concentration? Yes, that's it. So basically, you have a fertilizer that's 16, 16, 16, and one that's 555. Five, five. You take a pound of this fertilizer and a pound of this fertilizer. This one has, the one that's 16% has three times the amount of nitrogen as the one that's 5%. So, so it's just a. Put on a dosage right, thing. exactly. That's exactly how you do it, right? Um, and, you know, for example, when I'm working with golf courses, some that have a very high budget, they go, hey, I got this fertilizer in the shed. I don't really like it. What else do you got that has lower nitrogen? I go, oh, well, I got this other stuff, 545. Five. Okay, give me two pallets of it, boom, right? Well, then I got another guy who goes, I don't have any money. I'm like in the hole, but I got this fertilizer on the shelf I don't really like, but I need to put down half a pound of nitrogen. What do I do? Well, then just put down a little bit less of that and deal with what you got, okay? So um, you can manage it that way. Um, this over here is Grow Better Organic Fertilizer. I was selling that down in Southern California. Anyone know where you can get it here? It's a friend of mine, actually. Her name's Joyce Jong, Joyce and Mark. And they're, his parents own um, a very, very large chicken, um, like egg plantation or whatever you want to call it, okay, chicken farming. Um, and so this is a compost uh, product, a chicken compost product, but it's, uh, made, I think it's processed, a uh, cold, cold process. It doesn't smell, it smells kind of like clay. 
and it sticks together really well. So when you, when you start to water it, um, it'll kind of take up water and you can kind of squish it around like a little jelly bean. And it's really, really good stuff. But it's a very, very low analysis. So it's not like, you know, going to really pound your trees. If you really want your trees to have a boost, this isn't going to be it. It's kind of a sustainable thing. But yeah. Uh, any questions about where we're at here? So we're talking about macronutrients. We'll go into a few macros that we've already talked about. Just remind you guys why they're important. Okay. And then we'll go into a little bit of micronutrients. Okay. So nitrogen. Everyone says, yeah. Wait, your question. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, unfortunately. So this is hasn't been published yet, but they're not finding any results about the HB one one. Any difference? Yeah. In using it and not using it. Now they didn't test it on bonsai trees, so there's a little loophole there. But they haven't found anything with that. So um, that's all. That's the only information I have. So um, what I would have loved to do is, I don't, and they didn't, they did it a little bit differently. They did a couple different studies, but um, I would like to take some, just some juniper cuttings and see which ones root faster with that. That would be interesting. But um, other than that, yeah, that's about it. it. It did do a little bit better than not fertilizing at all because there's a little bit of fertilizer in HB 101. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No, all right. So nitrogen, okay. It's in proteins, right? So it's in amino, amino acids. Okay, so that's really important. And plants are built of proteins. We're built up, we're made up of proteins. That's why there's so much nitrogen in us, okay? So um, it's also um, in nucleic acids, uh, nucleic acids, so the genetic material that's in all of the cells for them to basically tell the cells what to do and also for reproduction, okay? So it's in there. And chlorophyll, okay? When we talk about it, especially in the landscape industry, when we say, oh, nitrogen, if you want something to green up, you give it nitrogen. Well, why, okay? Well, it's because nitrogen is the central component of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is the green, is the green molecules, the green, the green pigment in your trees, okay? So nitrogen is gonna help green it up. There's another thing that's gonna help green it up, okay, and we'll talk about it, and that's iron, okay? Um, you can literally spray um, an iron product on grass, and if you spray it too heavily, you can turn the grass black because it's so green, okay? It's really interesting, okay? But you can take an iron product and you can spray grass and then leave the other, like spray one stripe and leave the other stripe, and you get dark green here and then whatever the color you had before. Um, and if you get some on the pavement, it's gonna turn orange, right? So, because that iron gets taken up, depending on the product, pretty rapidly into the plant, and it can help green it up pretty fast, okay? But, um, so, I think there's eight, I think there's four iron atoms per every one nitrogen atom in chlorophyll, okay? But iron's really only in chlorophyll. 75% of all the iron is in chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is the minority of all plant tissue, okay? And nitrogen's in everything. All right, okay, um, it's applied on as ammonia, nitrate, or other organic um, materials, which is basically the same as, as ammonia. Um, and the nitrogen is always mobile in the plant, okay? And this is important. I give, I've given you guys a list of uh, nutrients, if they're mobile or immobile or partially mobile, okay? And it's on this slide here. Um, and that's important for diagnosing plants, okay? So that's really important. All right, so, um, Nitrogen is always mobile, okay? All right, we have phosphorus. What's the role of phosphorus? Okay, well, if you remember back from biology class or if you took a botany class, ATP, NADPH, that little P on the end, okay, that's phosphorus. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the kind of the money of biological systems, right? And NAD, um, NADP or NADPH, um, that's the currency, that's the energy. That's that, that plants use, okay? It takes so much ATP to get this process to happen. It takes so much NADP to get this process, whatever it is, okay? Without that P, without that phosphorus, okay, they would not have the energy that they need to, to, um, 
to, to basically help those metabolic processes take place, okay? So if you look on some fertilizer bags, you'll see, oh, this, if you look at one, it's, this one's for flowering plants, or this one's from fruiting plants, or something like that, or this is a tomato fertilizer. It's generally higher in phosphorus and potassium than a, an all-purpose fertilizer, okay? Or it's just the same, it's got 16%, you know, phosphorus and 15%, um, potassium and 0% nitrogen, maybe something like that, okay? And the reason being is because they link it to fruit because fruit are very, it, it takes a lot of energy to produce a fruit, right? Just like it takes a lot of energy, I don't know anything about this, but it takes a lot of energy to produce a child, okay? Same thing, right? So for plants, the fruit is its offspring and it puts everything into that, okay? So that's why phosphorus is very important, okay? Um, but what I've experienced is if you hold off nitrogen, that's more detrimental than um, giving them a little bit more nitrogen um, for basically fruit development. Okay, so if you, I don't really like fertilizers that have zero nitrogen in them. Okay, they, the, and the reality is because most of our soils, especially our bonsai soils, they're made of rock material. There's a ton of phosphorus in that rock material. Okay. It's about how do we let that phosphorus become available to the plant, and that's a, another story we can get into later, okay? But, um, yeah, so said to play a role in flowering and root formation. Adds, it's added to soils as phosphate fertilizers, okay? Um, phosphorus is less available in acid soils, okay? So if you have, like, an azalea mix or something like that, you may need some more phosphorus in there, okay? Um, phosphate fertilizers do not move readily from point of application. So um, phosphorus, although it is mobile, the um, phosphorus doesn't really move readily in the actual um, soil. Okay. Well, say I have a pot this big mm -hmm. and I put a tea bag on this uh -huh. side. Does it only get on this side of the tree or when it is absorbed by the roots over here? Does it then circulate throughout right. the cambium to get... So with your phosphorus, hole. it will actually move from that point of the root. So if that root takes it up, it will move the phosphorus into the plant, right? But once it gets to its location, it's not going to move very much. Nitrogen, um, it may actually may move a little bit. Nitrogen actually will go and it will travel. It'll go into one leaf and that when leaf's done with it. It'll go to another leaf and do its thing, right? But... Um, when you put it in a certain area, okay, so for example, let's say you have a Yamadori and all the roots are over here and you put phosphate fertilizer over here, it's not gonna, it's not gonna move that way. Whereas nitrogen, if you have a lot of nitrogen here and you water it, nitrogen is gonna travel with the water, whereas the phosphorus isn't gonna travel very much, okay? So that's kind of what I mean by it moving. It will move in the plant, but it won't move in your soil, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, and then we'll look at that a little bit more when we talk about mobility. Okay, and then potassium um, really assists in sugar and nutrient transport, okay? Um, another thing about potassium, potassium is important for the little pores on the underside of the leaves, which are called the stomata or stomates, and there's a potassium pump that actually helps to open up those pores and close them, okay? So potassium is important to have in the plant as well. Okay. And the way that it's applied to most soils is K2O, and it's in the form of potash. Okay. All right, a couple other macronutrients we don't talk about, okay, and we rarely fertilize with, but we should probably more often than not. Calcium, okay. Why is calcium so important for the plant? Well, it's really the cementing agent for cells, okay. It's what's called the middle lamella, so that kind of when you look at pictures of cells or diagrams at that intercellular space, it's not just air, okay? It's the cytosol, and calcium is what makes up that cytosol, okay? And so it can be applied with lime, dolomite, gypsum, things like that, okay? Um, magnesium is important, and magnesium, um, and manganese actually, magnesium is the central atom in the chlorophyll molecule, okay? And then you have nitrogen and you have some iron as well. There's a complex actually, okay? Um, and then you get magnesium from dolomite as well. However, okay, um, it's very important to figure out how much magnesium is really in your soil before you're actually um, 
fertilizing with that because too much magnesium can throw off the calcium levels and there's kind of a lot of different things like that. So um, how do we do that? How do we know in, in, in bone size? I'd get a water test before anything because water plays a large role in our very poor soils. Okay, water kind of is what dictates the chemistry of our soils, right? Unless you have a plant that's been in a pot for a long time and it's, you know, the, that soil has been broken down, then that's going to hold its own chemistry a lot better than a newly repotted plant. Okay. All right, and then we have sulfur, and sulfur is an important component of vital amino acid, amino acid synthesis, which is cysteine and methionine. Um, that's kind of some science jargon, but um, sulfur is a very important uh, fertilizer, and my theory on why trees look so much better after a rainfall is because of the sulfur, especially down in Southern California. There's a lot of pollution in the air, um, sulfuric acid, okay, um, is, so we hear about that acid rain, right? Well, the sulfur comes down, fertilizes the plants a little bit, and they take on a little bit different look. Um, I have another friend who's a photographer, and he said, well, I think it's because it's a better day to take pictures. That's why they look better. And I thought, well, whatever. He's like, well, because cloudy days are always good to take pictures, and that's why the plants look better, because it's a light thing. Well, whatever. Okay. No. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he says. But I was like, no, 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 no. I, I can tell. I don't. It's not a trick of the lights. My tree looks better right now. It's, it's, it's really happy. Yeah, and it's it's got a lot of water in it. It just fills up. It looks everything looks a little bit better, right? And I'm learning that water, rainwater really helps to kind of flush out everything that we've been putting into the soil, especially during the summer. Okay, there's a lot of evaporation happening. I don't care whose water it is, unless you have a deionized watering system and then there's other problems there um, but water our tap water has a lot of sodium in it which is great for us because we need sodium plants hate sodium you notice it's not one of their nutrients sodium is just not something that plants need and so sodium does a lot of damage and sodium sits in the soil so at the end of the summer your plants look a little bit stressed out it's really because that sodium you get a good rainfall in the fall you're good yeah Kat. Yeah. I generally tell them get a big bucket, fill up your, your bucket with water or trash can with water, mm -hmm. and throw a handful or two of chips in there. Yeah. The sodium with that, and then yeah. Water. Exactly. And you can do the same thing by just putting, um, it depends on the condition of the soil, right? If you have, if the tree's been in a pot for five years and the soil's broken down, if you put gypsum right on the surface of the soil, that could clog the pores up a little bit. But if you still have a pretty porous, um, soil, you can just put gypsum right on the top and water it in. And that calcium, actually, that's what we do. I have a client in Antioch, uh, Lone Tree Golf Course, and they have all reclaimed water, and he just, it's just a nightmare for him. He has lots of magnesium and a lot of sodium um, in, his, in his soil. Well, he's, every month, he's pounding it with gypsum and then irrigating a lot, because what that does, it helps that sodium to move through the soil and get out of the system. The problem is when you get high temperatures like this week, that evaporation, sodium wicks up through the soil column. So in a pot, it's a little bit easier. You'll get it to drain out, but in the soil, it's, it's, it's kind of just a continual battle, right? So that's that. But yeah, so good, good point on that. Calcium, dosing with calcium um, helps to reduce uh, sodium. There is another product that I just learned about um, that, that we carry at my company, but there's lots of products like this. They're basically soil acidifiers, and you just mix it with water, and you can water your plant with it, and that reduces bicarbonate and sodium levels during that watering cycle. Right? So I'm going to experiment with that for redwoods. Redwoods, they do not like the sodium. I think that's one of the biggest problems. Um, so uh, yeah, so gypsum, and then also, so I have a client in Brentwood, actually, who has redwoods on his property. and they're, you know, they're dying out. And so we're gonna experiment. I'm having them pound it with gypsum around the drip line and then put this product down and then heavily irrigate to see if we can keep them alive until the rains come. So that's a little experiment I'm doing, so we'll see. I don't know anything about that. Tell me about it. Oh yeah, fluoride definitely is, yeah. I don't know it, what fluoride does to plants. That's a good question. It's yeah, not on your list. it's not on that list. No, so fluoride. But I don't know if fluoride is as damaging um, as 
uh, sodium is, right? And then other people go, oh, we got a lot of chlorine. Well, chlorine's not a big deal. On high concentrations, oh yeah. But plants actually need chlorine. The chlorine's in there as well. So we're gonna just quickly get into micronutrients and then we're gonna go into the garden, okay? Um, I say quickly get into micronutrients, uh, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, okay, so there are your micros. You got boron, chlorine, manganese, iron, zinc, copper, molybdenum, and nickel. And those are actually, I believe they're in the order in which they are, uh, the concentration, yeah, of the plant. So there's the least um, concentrated is nickel. So very little nickel in the plant, okay? Um, so what's a micronutrient? Same deal, okay, so these nutrients are vital, but they're only found in trace elements, okay? And you, I don't know if it has it on there, but there are some other uh, printouts that, I think it's not, yeah, it's not on this one, but, um, I have another one, maybe I'll give that to you guys, but basically shows what's the concentration in a healthy plant tissue, which really isn't that important um, because every species is different, right? So uh, depending on the labs that, uh, depending on the lab and the information they have, like for example, I had um, a client send out some juniper tissue to a lab and they did have a juniper template, which basically means we have that we know the normal ranges of a garden juniper. So they can kind of give you your, your ranges. Um, and so what they'll do, if you do a tissue analysis, they'll take the tissue and then they'll test all the elements and see what percent of that tissue was nitrogen, what percent was phosphorus, what percent was this, this, and that, and then tell you, hey, what's off and what's not, okay? So you can actually do that. You can take a leaf if you feel like it's not a disease. It's some kind of what I call abiotic stress or it's a nutrient deficiency. You can go, well, I don't know what it is. Cut some of those leaves off if you can, and you can take it to a lab and have them do a test. It's something like anywhere from... I want to say 30 to $50 or something like that, you know, not including shipping. So you have to overnight it because it is plant tissue. So. All right. Um, oh, let's see. So these are frequently unavailable to the plant because they are not in, um, in solution, even though there's sufficient amount in, in the soil. Okay. So this is important. When you do a soil test, you may have high amounts of iron in the soil, high amounts of even phosphorus, but maybe high amounts of iron, high amounts of... Um, uh, manganese or molybdenum, but it's not available to the plant, okay, because of some other issue, whether it's because you have a lot of calcium, whether it's you have a high pH or a low pH, okay, these, these elements can be bound up in the soil and therefore not be available. So someone goes, oh, it's lacking iron. Well, let's treat with some iron. Okay, you could do that or you can figure out, okay, is there enough iron in my soil? You, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Well, let's just lower the pH of the soil by doing something, okay? And then we can allow the tree to have some of that iron, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, while we're on the subject of iron, in Southern California, this is huge. I think in most California landscapes. So iron um, deficiency is very, is very common. And the reason being is because of high or alkaline soils, high pH. So as you get into a higher pH, iron tends to bind to the soil particles and to other nutrients, okay? And then they kind of make this complex and then plants can't take it up. So um, iron chlorosis is a common um, symptom or a common diagnosis for a lot of um, plants in, in the landscape, okay? So what is it? Lack of iron causes an inner venal chlorosis, okay? or a yellowing. When we say chlorosis, we basically mean a lack of green, and so it's kind of a yellow color, right? And then the symptoms appear for iron generally on the younger leaves because iron is, has been considered immobile, but it's really partially mobile. So what does that mean? Nitrogen is very mobile, so when we see a nitrogen deficiency, it's kind of overall, the plant doesn't look very good, okay? Um, but when we see a iron deficiency, the um, newer, or sorry, the um, younger leaves tend to be a little bit more chlorotic and then the older leaves are not, okay? Because the younger leaves ha are the ones that have been put on more recently and if it doesn't have enough iron, the iron's not gonna move to those younger leaves. And so that's a really big key indicator. Uh, when you go, when you look at a plant and um, it's got new buds and new leaves and they're a lot more yellow than they should be, okay? iron or some other immobile 
nutrient is probably the problem. And it's maybe not that that nutrient isn't in the soil, but it may be because the soil um, has too high of a pH or too low of a pH, something like that. Okay, so that's something we want to look at. So can I ask, so if yeah. If you, if you could either add more iron or lower the pH, or it doesn't matter how much iron you add, if, if the pH is too high, it's not going to be good. Right, so it's kind of like, let me see here if I can, if I can paint a picture. So um, you could add iron, and that will help kind of correct it moment for, for a short period of time. But then you're most likely going to have a problem again in the future. Um, so uh, and I don't know why I thought of this, but I'll share it with you. Uh, when I was growing up, we had a van. And the, the, the chrome on the handle for the driver's seat, uh, like it was starting to peel off. Well, chrome's metal, and it's, it was sharp. So my dad, he cut himself a couple times on it. Well, he would just put a Band-Aid over it, but he wouldn't fix that. Well, then his, he would take the Band-Aid off, and he'd cut himself again. Well, eventually he said, well, dang it, I need to fix this thing, right? So he took that handle off and got a new handle, and now that's fixed. So that's kind of the same thing, right? So we can, we can do a foliar application with some iron, or we can pound some iron on it, and that will help it well. But what's going to happen to that iron that's left in the soil? Is it going to bind up? So we have to kind of look at what the root of the problem is, no pun intended, and then um, try to figure out how we can um, really correct the problem instead of kind of do a Band-Aid patch, right? Right, so that may also be an issue too. So you may look at it and go, you know what, I need to lower the pH. Why do I have a high pH? Well, maybe because my water's coming out of the tap and it's 8.0. That's why I have high pH. Well, you can try to change that with a couple different things. You can add organic material to your soil. So you can say, okay, well, I know right now I'm not going to repot the tree, but I need to be repotted in the fall. And this one tends to really not like high alkaline soil. So I'm going to put some bark in it or something else, some more organic material, so that when that water gets in there and it sits in the, in the soil, that organic material is going to help to acidify it. It may be to the point where you have a tree and it goes, you know what, every August and September, it's, it just needs a little bit of iron because, it, because the pH is too high in the soil. And I'm okay with just spraying a little bit of iron on it. And that's fine, you know. So you just kind of have to look at that, right? Um, so um, that's kind of where you kind of get into different opinions, right? Well, what should you do? Well, somebody goes, oh, you got to repot it. And the other person goes, oh, just hit it with some iron. And someone else goes, oh, don't water it as much. Okay, well, all of those things can play a role. Well, if you don't water it as much, you're not keeping the root system and a high pH because of the tap water, and you're allowing the organic material to acidify that. And so there's some other things that you can do, right? So there's, a, there's always lots of different options. Does that answer your question, though, Janice? OK. Janet. Do roots have a limited capacity to absorb nutrients? Like if you give it too much, it just won't absorb it? Yes. Or is it going to burn it? And if you overload it with this um, application, will it prevent it from taking up some other application because it's already overloaded? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> that can happen, right? Okay, so for example, um, there's a certain amount of nitrogen that a plant can take up. It's just, there's just, and it changes from species to species, but there's certain ways that it can take up nitrogen, right? Um, certain species will take up a lot of nitrogen, especially weeds, right? So this is why weeds are a big problem in bonsai pots. It's a very confined space, very, um, little nutrients for the most part, and sometimes little water. Well, weed species have been known to take up more water than is necessary for them and more nutrients. So, it's, um, so that's a problem for weeds. Well, um, certain plants have the ability to take up more nutrients or, um, or kind of surpass their threshold. Uh, and so you can definitely over fertilize. Um, and then the problem with over fertilizing, especially if it's a chemical fertilizer, you can run into burning the plant. When it's um, an organic fertilizer and you over fertilize, the biggest problem is you're putting too much organic material in there, you're acidifying the soil too rapidly, and you're causing very acid situations, which for uh, conifers, not very good. Okay.
Okay, and so that's kind of the problem. It's kind of like I don't know if you guys have ever. My wife one time accidentally, we had different potting mixes, and one was a what's called bumper crop. It's basically just a composted material, um, <clears throat> and then we had another potting mix. Well, we kind of I don't know what happened, but for some reason she was potting up these seedlings in this bumper crop, which is really just like a compost they're supposed to incorporate into the soil. Well, immediately they all turned yellow and were super stunted and we're like, what's the deal? And we realized, oh, well, she used this really rich organic um, bumper crop for these seedlings and that really hurt them. So and that's kind of your biggest problem with um, organic, over fertilizing with organic material. Um, versus over fertilizing with a synthetic or chemical fertilizer. Okay. Chemical fertilizers, very quick, immediate response. Um, organic fertilizers, a little bit slower. Okay. All right, so really quick, show you a picture. So that's kind of what we're talking about, chlorosis. Okay, that's pretty bad. Um, but that plant, when I look at that, that plant is fine, except for iron. Those leaves look great, they're not burned on the margins. Um, they have a very good shape to them. They're not stunted. That's just straight iron, okay? When you get stunting, when you get curling, that's a little bit more, okay? That may be a zinc deficiency. It may be a magnesium or manganese, whatever it is. So we're not gonna talk about all of those because every plant responds differently to different um, nutrient deficiencies, okay? Um, at least slightly. And so, but this is kind of what I'm talking about, chlorosis, okay? And you guys will see that. I don't know if you've heard uh, like pines, if they, someone says, oh, they need to be, they kind of get yellow leaves. Oh, it's because it hasn't been repotted in a long time. That's one reason, but the real reason is because the soil may either be too acidic, may be too basic, or they've exhausted the soil of nutrients and it's not getting what it needs, okay? So, um, yeah, I, Ryan and I had a discussion about uh, how often plants should be repotted, trees should be repotted, and it was amazing to me to see how long. I mean, he, you know, he hasn't had a lot of his trees for more than five years, um, except for some that he had before Japan. But, you know, he really, his goal is really to get seven to eight years uh, minimum out of each one of his conifers, and then move forward. Uh, Mr. Kimura's uh, big beautiful juniper, this most famous one. Um, what's it called? Mm, I can't, I don't speak Japanese, but tree. yeah, the dragon tree. How do you say that? In, it's to, to, Toyoromai or something like that? Yeah. Right. Uh, never been repotted since the very first uh, transition. So, and Ryan said that uh, Mr. Kimura probably will never repot that. So, um, and, and, and then he also said he feels sorry for the person that's going to inherit that. So, <laughs> But um, it's been in that pot, I think, for 15, 16 years, maybe more, something like that. And he has no intention of repotting. So what does that tell you? Well, if you are really good with horticulture, which many of the Japanese artists, especially Mr. Kimura, um, you, can, you can manage um, those, those conditions. Okay. All right, um, okay, so some of these other uh, um, elements, basically what they do is they just serve to help catalyze biochemical reactions, okay? And that's why there's really no large need for them in the plant, okay? So boron, manganese, copper, zinc, molybdenum, chlorine, um, and some of your landscapes that have reclaimed water, you'll see there's, you'll get um, boron toxicity really fast or manganese um, toxicity really fast because there's too high concentration in copper as well, things like that. Okay, all right, let's see. Oh, this is kind of the take home message right here. Oop, I'll show you that. So, things to remember uh, there are many variables that affect nutrient availability for your plants. Okay, number one is well, is there anything in the soil? Did you actually fertilize? Okay, some people kind of go, well, that's a dumb question. Well, a lot of people don't fertilize, okay, or fertilize enough. The other one is the pH of your soil, and your, what I say when I say soil water, I mean the moisture that's left in your soil once the water is drained through, okay. And then the other thing would be the cation exchange capacity, which we talked about in depth in January, um, of your soil. How what's what is the ability? How much? nutrients can your soils hold on to and exchange with the plant. 
okay? It's different to have a nutrient holding capacity and a nutrient exchange capacity, right? So like some of these products like Turfus, Turfus does a really good job holding water, does a really good job of holding nutrients. It does a very poor job of giving it away, okay? It w does not like to give up water, does not like to give up nutrients. Um, and that's why they use it in, um, you know, baseball fields. And they take it when they get a rain out, what do they do? They take turfus and they just spread over the whole field. Holds that water, doesn't give it away. Okay, so, um, but Akadama will give water away and, um, and nutrients, but not as freely as pumice. But pumice, pumice just doesn't have the capacity to hold it very, for very long, okay? Holds very, very little nutrients. Okay, so that's important. So these are kind of your factors. And depending on which way you want to skin the cat, you can, you can manage your problems this way. Yeah, so Jen. does a, a tree with lots of roots have a better ability to absorb them? Like right after you've repotted and trimmed the roots, mm -hmm. it can't absorb much because there's fewer roots to absorb it. Yes. But if it's root bound, it also can because it's compacted. It, that, is, that is very true, right? So the amount of fine feeder roots that a tree has um, determines how fast it can take up um, the nutrients. That doesn't necessarily mean how fast a maybe organic fertilizer is going to break down. Cause that's different, okay? Because organic fertilizers break down not because trees are using their nutrients, but because the soil biological activity is converting it and then making those nutrients available to the plant. And at that point, it's up to the plant to take them up, okay? So there was one thing that um, I've heard you know, and I used to say a lot about, you know, bio gold, for example. Um, bio gold, I've had some trees where I'd put bio gold on there and it sat on the surface of the soil for six months. Other trees, three, three weeks, it starts to break down and just go nuts. And I'm thinking, wow, well, this tree's really hungry, the other tree's not. Well, that's not true. It's because this tree's root zone is more healthy and the other trees is not. That's what I realized, okay? And that, that, that's all because of soil biological activity, okay? But um, a tree that has a lot of fine feeder roots has the ability to take up more nutrients than a tree that doesn't, okay? So that is uh, kind of important. So um, a tree that's very root bound though, so if you look at it on a longevity standpoint and some of these trees in Japan, a tree that's very root bound, well, it, maybe it's good it doesn't take up a lot of nutrients. Maybe it's good it doesn't take up a lot of water because now we can keep it growing pretty slowly, right? So, so yes to all your questions and there's no right or wrong answer. It all depends on what stage your tree's in, what you want to happen, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Interesting, right? To kind of, because all this information, it's not new information, but looking at it in, from different angles kind of gives you a different perspective on things, right? Okay. All right, so keep that in mind. Um, what I want to show you here is this is something I, um, I show to my students in, when I teach horticulture. And this is kind of just roughly, this is what you're looking at. When you have certain pH, okay, this is your availability of um, nutrients. Okay? So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, when you fertilize with those at a higher pH, plants take them up very readily. If you have a very acid soil, okay, then nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are going to be limiting. Um, in the soil itself, but your your micronutrients, especially iron, very very high um, concentration in the soil. Okay, but as you get into high alkaline soils, your iron starts to drop off. Your manganese, your boron are kind of right here in this middle range. But this is kind of what we look at there. Okay, so the more acid your soil is, the more uh, or the least likely you're going to have micronutrient deficiencies. The more alkaline your soil is the more likely you're gonna have micronutrient dis deficiencies. And so on the West Coast in general, we're always over here. So we have lots of deficiencies here in the micro column, very few deficiencies up here, okay? Always gonna have a deficiency in nitrogen because it moves to the soil so quickly, but if we're fertilizing properly, it's not gonna be an issue, okay? Any questions on that? And I'll give you guys this, or if you look it up, Google it, you'll find lots of different pictures just like that. As far as how are, are these plants mobile, are these plants not mobile, okay, um, yes or no. So nitrogen is very mobile, okay, phosphorus is mobile, and I mean mobile in the plant, the mobility of it in the plant, okay. 
Um, potassium is pretty mobile. Calcium is immobile. All right. Uh, sulfur is mobile. Uh, magnesium, I'm not sure. So I'd have to actually look that up. Okay. So basically, everything's mobile here except for calcium. All in right. the plant. In the plant, not yes. In the soil. Not in the soil. That's a little bit different. Okay. Calcium's mobile, or sorry, nitrogen's mobile everywhere. In the soil, in the atmosphere, in the plant, it's just very slippery. And what I showed you with the iron, okay, really I kind of look at it as iron and nitrogen, all right? So um, when we look at certain conditions, those are kind of the two main things. When you have young leaves that look yellow, you know it's an immobile nutrient, okay? Something like iron or something that's partially, partially um, mobile in the soil or, or in, in the plant. So you're looking at iron. When you have um, a very, when you have green young leaves and your older leaves or your older needles look yellow, that is because of a mobile nutrient, something like nitrogen, okay? A deficiency of a mobile nutrient. Why is that? Well, because the tree is putting on new leaves and there's new growth and that's where the nutrient is needed. And so nitrogen will move from an old leaf and go into a new leaf. And now the old leaf is lacking um, chlorophyll. Okay, So that's a good way to tell if it needs a little bit more nitrogen. Okay. Does that make sense? So we should cut out the yellow leaves. You could, or you could, if you want to keep them, you should just fertilize with a little bit of nitrogen. Yeah. The yellow leaf is never going to turn green again. Oh, oh no. Yes, it will. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. If it's an old leaf that's senescing and going to die, yeah. yeah. But if it's a leaf yeah, that's... A vibrant leaf that just happens to be yellow. Or a leaf that got put on earlier this year yeah. versus a leaf that got put on last week, you know? It could green up. It can green up, yeah. Okay. And if we were going to get really tricky, if we, which is hard, but there's a, like cytokinin, there's certain hormones that you can get, and you can get leaves that are like maybe turning yellow or red and going to fall off in the fall, you can have them stay on the plant a little bit longer. You can stretch it a couple weeks if you put that on, which is kind of tricky, kind of interesting. Um, I don't know of a, of a commercially available product like that yet, other than um, sea kelp extract has um, cytokines in it, but pretty interesting, right? Um, and I think you could probably stretch that and say, well, could we keep our blossoms on a little bit longer? And then if that's the case, then, well, hey, what do we need to spray on our trees right before a show, right? Let's say we get our, if something get, it starts to blossom and the show's in 10 days, you're like, no, could you just wait five more days? Maybe we can put something on them and get them to hold out a little bit longer. So if we have, so right here, this is the youngest leaf on this branch. These are a little bit older, okay? So let's say we had a larger branch and we can see the leaves a little bit we see more of the leaves, okay? Some of the older leaves and some of the newer leaves. I'm not saying old leaf as it's about to shed that leaf, but older leaf like it got put on in June versus a leaf that got put on last week, okay? So um, your yellow leaves, or your young leaves, if they're yellow, that means it's an immobile nutrient deficiency, most likely iron, okay? So um, it could be another nutrient, but it's an immobile nutrient. So we'll look into, okay, well, maybe it's iron. Well, if we know we've been putting down iron, then, or putting on iron, then maybe it's not iron. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's zinc. Okay. Um, something like that. Well, the other thing may be where we have green young leaves, and the older leaves are starting to turn a little bit yellow, lose their color, start to fade. Okay. Well, that may be a nitrogen deficiency, a deficiency of a nutrient that's very mobile because it can move to where the plant now needs it. The plant needs it more in the new leaves because the new leaves are going to photosynthesize more. Okay, they're going to stretch out of the canopy a little bit more, get more sunlight. Okay, that's more important to the plant, so it'll do that. Also, it can take nitrogen and it can move it to like a fruit or a flower, whatever, wherever it needs it, okay? Because it's a mobile nutrient, so that's kind of important. So when we look at a tree, when I look at a plant and I go, oh, is it the young leaves that are stunted or is it the old leaves? 
So is the young leaves that look chlorotic or is it the old leaves? I can tell right away, okay, I can, I can just kind of go, okay, now I only have to focus on these many nutrients instead of these many nutrients, okay? So we went through the macronutrients and their mobility, okay, and these are the micronutrients and their mobility. Most of the micronutrients are pretty much immobile, okay? They're partially mobile, very, not very mobile, okay? You have chlorine that's pretty mobile. Um, I don't know what a chlorine deficiency looks like in a plant. I don't know if I've ever seen that. Okay. Generally, when you get a zinc and a manganese deficiency, or sorry, zinc or magnesium, I believe, maybe manganese as well, but you see some purpling of the leaves as well. You get some uh, what's called a little bit of a red or a blue pigment um, in there. Uh, but iron, it's really that chlorosis. Um, and then you can get different types of chlorosis. If you want to kind of start splitting hairs, you can get chlorosis on the veins or intervenal between the veins. Intervenal means basically between the veins and just that blank tissue of the leaf. Okay? But when you're looking at a black pine, the needle just turns yellow. I mean, you're not going to see anything between within the needle itself, right? So this apical dominance thing, basically it's driven by auxin. Auxin is at the tip of the branches or at the top of the tree. And when we remove that portion, okay, now cytokinins can grow or can be synthesized and then they initiate bud break or lateral growth, okay, until one takes over. Um, and then uh, the, the cycle will continue to, to, um, to happen, okay? So that's, that's kind of what apical dominance is. And then when we look at trees in the landscape, and this is kind of going into design, okay? So this is a little bit uh, out of my realm, but um, kind of what I dabble in more as a hobbyist, not a professional, but is design. So um, we look at trees that have very good apical dominance and then apical control, okay? So uh, if I remember this correctly, as, as arborists, okay, there are trees that have good apical dominance Okay, or have strong apical dominance and trees that have strong apical control. Apical control would be a tree that actually is very pointed, okay, so a conifer. So some junipers, some pines, okay, um, even some deciduous trees like liquid ambars, okay, They're, they have a lot of apical control, meaning the top is very strong, much stronger than anything else, okay, and then apical dominant tree, um, and there's other names for it. I think it's um, X current trees and something like that. But anyways, an apically dominant tree, okay, um, would be more of a deciduous tree that all of the branches are fighting to be dominant. So you have a broad kind of, you know, look to it. Okay, so that's so that's um, kind of a little bit there. But really, it's driven by hormones. All right. Okay. So yeah, the main or central stem suppresses the growth of the stems or buds, okay? Um, and you know, this is why we, this, when we do this, okay, we, we prune branches and we affect that apical dominance, okay? And there's multiple reasons why we may do this, okay? So we may do it because you know, we wanna increase ramification. How do we do that? We cut that one, the tip off, now we get two branches. And if, if in a perfect world, we get two branches and we cut those and now we get four branches and we cut those and it's a factorial, right? Before we know it, we have this super twiggy, really nice branch. It doesn't always work, but um, it works most of the time, okay? Um, we also might remove just unwanted branches. Also, when we prune branches on a tree that's very old, not very vigorous, if we've addressed all of the other problems, okay? If we've kind of come to the end of the road and going, hey, I think everything's fine with this tree, it just is a little bit, just not vigorous. Pruning the tree can kind of affect the concentration of hormones and then encourage a little bit of vigor in that tree, okay? So that is another thing that, that can be done, especially in the landscape. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about um, large branch removal and my, my theory on this has, I wouldn't say changed, but evolved a little bit. Um, so we do flush cuts, right? And then, or we, we do concave or convex, um, really not convex, but in the horticultural world, it's kind of, it's taboo now to make a flush cut the way we do in bonsai. If we wanna remove that branch, we make a flush cut so it heals over properly. Well, um, you know, that's what we do with deciduous trees, at least what I do. Uh, with conifers, I'll leave a branch and then leave it as a gin if it looks good. So, um, 
Anyway, so we have this, these two different styles of cutting, okay? So horticulturally, a flush cut is not good, and I'll tell you why, okay? It increases the wound surface. So if we have a branch, okay, look, it's my arm, and we cut it here, we have a certain area, okay, where the cambium is exposed and the wound is a certain size. Well, now if I take it and do a flush cut right here over my whole shoulder, that's a very large wound, right? And so that increases the surface area and increases the chance of infection to occur, an entry point for bacteria or an insect, okay? Or even fungi. So that's why horticulturally um, that's bad practice, okay? But in bonsai, uh, there's a, we have a higher desire for aesthetics, okay? And that's why we do it um, in bonsai, okay? Um, so if done properly, it can speed the callusing, and it's really just more aesthetically pleasing, okay? Um, so let's take a look at this. This is actually a, the tree that I was talking about when I was in grad school. This is, um, what is it, podocarpus, okay? This is a podocarpus, and this is, horticulturally, this is where you, this is what you'd want to do. You'd want to cut it, and you leave that branch collar intact. So this is, this portion here is called the collar of the branch, okay? And then the branch kind of comes in here, where a knot, a knot would be formed, okay? So this is the area here, and that area is preserved. Um, it preserves really, really well. And so even if that area gets a little bit of fungal damage, it will compartmentalize, and we'll talk about what that's called, um, compartmentalize that decay into that one portion. But if we had cut it here, okay, now we have less of the collar left, and we're exposing this inner wood tissue to um, decay, okay? So that can be a problem. Well, it doesn't always happen, but there's a big risk with that. But you can see what that wound looks like. This is probably three, four years later. And I'll tell you what, this will probably never heal up. Never. This is probably a 12 inch gap between the two. And this is rolling over pretty nicely, but eventually it's gonna slow down. It's gonna roll maybe at about here, and that's it, okay? Because this is a large landscape tree. If it was a younger tree, it probably would close even more, but this tree is fully mature. It's not growing very much more uh, as far as height, okay? So that's that. And this one was, I don't know, maybe they had another Krug, um, but this one was on the same tree actually, and it was a flush cut. And it was done probably around the same time, okay? Maybe a year or two difference. And you can see it's completely closed up, and this is the side profile. Okay, so the tree was like this, and they just did a real flush cut. And it actually looks pretty good, right? But it's closed up. Okay, so horticulturally, this would be bad practice. Now it's fine. There's nothing you can do about it. But for bonsai, this is kind of what, um, what we want, right? And then the last picture here is those are the two cuts. This is the one that's closed up, and this is the one that's not. Well, I like the way this looks. And they took a risk. I don't know if they meant to do it, but it looks a lot better. And if they'd done it here, who knows? Who knows? Well, is there another option? Is there another option? Well, could you leave the collar on the cambium uh -huh. and hollow out the, the pithy wood underneath? You could, right? You would still have this a little bit, and you'd get it to roll in, and then you maybe you'd have some kind of a hollow or something like that. Well, yeah. Right, yeah, definitely, yeah. So there's definitely more options. They could have left it and then ginned it. <laughs> um, yeah. Sometimes I'm tempted to, like, I see some landscape trees and there's this big old dead branch and they're sawing off. I'm like, just gin it. I don't know what trunk splitters I would need, you know, something like this. But anyways, so um, I thought that was interesting. I don't know if you guys thought the same. Okay, so this is, this is uh, Walter Paul talks about this a lot on why you shouldn't use cut paste. Well, okay, I think I agree in, in that aspect. So this is a thing called um, compartmentalization, or it's called CODIT, and it uh, stands for um, compartmentalization of decay in trees. Okay. There's a, a horticulturist uh, scientist back in the 70s named Shigo, S-H-I-G-O. Yeah, and uh, he was the one that discovered this. And basically, meaning hey, we don't need to seal trees because trees have evolved over years and they know how to do it on their own. Basically what happens is they compartmentalize, so a decay will get into a certain portion of the tree. Well, the wood is compartmentalized because it's a, um, chemically a little bit different. 
and then only that certain portion will decay and the rest of it will not, okay, and then very small portions. Um, and trees actually where the branches are, if you leave that branch collar intact, that wood has a lot of antifungal, antibacterial properties, and so it preserves very well, okay? And that's most likely why that other tree didn't um, decay in that area. It does vary on the, the, the type of wood, also the environment as well. But in general, trees um, are very, uh, can compartmentalize that decay within that collar, right? So, and it depends on the amount of time that that decay has taken place, okay? Um, so this is a response to injury that trees do, okay? It forms literally a physical and chemical barrier to that decay. All right, so does this mean no cut paste? I don't think so, okay? And the main reason why is because um, I do not use cut paste to keep out fungus. I do not use cut paste to keep out, well, sometimes insects. Um, but if I was trying to keep out decay, then fungus, or the, the cut paste would not, I don't think it would really work. Because if anything, they've actually found that when they sealed trees up, they had a higher incidence of decay and rot, fungal decay and rot inside there. Because what happened is they made the cut already. Well, there's fungal spores and bacteria all in the environment and it got on there. And now all they did was seal it up and keep the moisture in and the fungus just said, oh, that sounds great. Just went right into the tree, okay? But that's not why I use cut paste. So um, just because compartmentalization is true for trees doesn't mean that cut paste doesn't have a place, okay? Um, but horticulturally, putting a sealant on is bad practice because their only focus is decay, okay? Um, but for me, in bonsai, oh, that's another thing. Um, I actually put it on to help the wound to stay moist longer, to prevent rapid desiccation, and so that will callus over a little bit better. Um, and that's kind of why I use it. Also, I, I'll use it on certain trees, like maybe a spruce or something like that. If I've cut a branch off, to put it on there to kind of keep some of the sap from just oozing right out of there, okay, and then dripping over of the bark. Yeah. I'm going to underscore that. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you're gonna do, if you want to save on the cut paste, yeah, you, you actually you do the outside edge and leave the center open. Yeah, that's basically the better way to do it. Yeah, and so, spot on, Kathy. I think that's that's the important thing is to cover up the cambium, um, and that layer of living tissue to keep it moist. Right. Okay, um, the other thing is, and this is kind of goes along with what Janet said, compartmentalization, this coat it, it is a genetic thing as well. So certain trees will do it more than others based on the species, okay? We'll do it better than others, all right? Um, conifers do it a lot better than certain deciduous trees, okay? All right, oh, and this is actually uh, Peter T, okay? So, um, he, this is some pictures that he had back in uh, Japan when he was doing his apprenticeship there. And so a small, pretty small uh, wound there. And uh, he removed that and put cut paste over the whole thing. But when he had a very large one, well, he decided, well, why put cut paste over that whole thing? And he did exactly what, what uh, Kathy was saying. So just put it over the, the live tissue area and help it to roll over. So that's kind of what you do on a large cut. Right. Even more, yeah. Yeah, and then that's the thing too because this is going to dry up eventually and it will recede. It shrinks a little bit, and so it, you know, if we're spending a lot of time and money on our trees, what's ten cents more of cut paste? Just, let's just go for it, right? But yeah, very good thing. Why? Oh yeah. Sometimes, you know, your eyes drawn to that fresh piece of wood, you can just cut it right, cover it right up. Okay. 
Um, this is something that very few people talk about, but I just wanted to, this is something that we do in horticulture, okay? Um, you can prune leaves, prune leaves. You can take leaves off, you can do a defoliation, a partial or a full defoliation, okay? But there's another thing that a lot of people don't really um, talk about, but they do in Japan as well, they do leaf cutting, okay? In the horticulture world, we leaf cut when we do, when we make cuttings. So when we actually take cuttings from plants, we will take a leaf and we'll cut the leaf in half and that reduces the amount of water the leaf needs and then that will increase um, the, the rate at which that cutting will take because we're reducing the stress, okay? So you can do that as well, all right? And also by reducing the leaf surface, you reduce how much water it needs and you also reduce how much photosynthesis is taking place and so you can reduce the amount of energy that that tree is accumulating, okay? So sometimes this technique can be used depending on the species reducing the size of those big leaves and then getting a smaller flush of leaves to happen afterwards, okay? Does that make sense? Because basically you're just reducing the amount of photosynthesis taking place for that tree without like putting it in the shade and, and harming it that way, okay? Um, let's see. And um, let's see what else. Okay, so when we leaf prune, there's a couple of reasons why. We can do it to increase ramification. It depends on the tree, okay? Um, really, a balance of energy, and that's why I talked about leaf cutting or removing the leaf in general, balancing that energy. You can think of it kind of like economics. If you have a lot of leaves, you can get a lot of photosynthesis in a certain area versus another area. We can take one area that has a, that's very strong, it's very heavy, we can reduce some of those, um, those leaves and then we can allow uh, a lot more balance to happen, okay? And this is what we do with pines. If you have a very weak tree and it's only got a few branches on it, don't go pruning it to try to get more branches. That's probably not the best bet. Some evergreens back in Southern California, some of the better um, coast live oak growers, they actually defoliate their coast live oaks, which is really incredible to do. Uh, and they get very, very vigorous trees, okay? Um, but it's important to do it at the right time of the year and the right stage uh, of the tree. All right, so why do we not prune uh, conifers back all the way to no foliage? Uh, I kind of like to think of them as a semi-truck. You know, they take a long time to get going. Once they get going, maybe it's a little hard to stop them for them to slow down, but they just, they don't really have, they're not built for that type of very rapid development. Um, some trees will respond different than others, but um, they're kind of that, you know, one or two flush of growth um, uh, trees, right? So you really don't want to do that. Yeah, Kathy. Yeah, the only time mushroom trim back conifers to nothing yeah. is really not that to nothing is they're already budding. Yeah. And if they have not opened up, exactly. Pines, for example, you can cut back and leave that. Or pines that have gone through and lost almost all their foliage because of some cold or something. Right. Like that. Right. Definitely. And right, right. And definitely, you know, pines, especially if they have a healthy root system, you can come and prune them back, and they will actually bud back um, with from those buds that are back, and then even buds that are just suppressed in the in the in the park. Right. Okay. Um, and I think I have a slide here a little bit on yeah energy. Okay. So this is kind of on the same. Uh, note here. So uh, there's two things called sources and sinks, okay? So we talk about this when we talk about energy balance. Well, we have a source for energy. What would be the source for energy on the plant? What's gathering the energy? Leaves, leaves okay? So leaves. Roots really aren't gathering energy. They're taking up resources, yes, water and nutrients, but not really energy, right? So the leaves are the source, right? But if you're looking at water, okay, you can say the roots are the source of water, okay? So, but you have your source, and then what would be a sink? What's taking that energy? Anything that's growing, right? Okay, things that are gonna take the most energy, okay, new growth, yes. Number one would be fruits and flowers, the most energy demanding thing, okay? And that's the whole reason why trees live, okay? Um, does that mean that if we have a conifer that's that has cones, we should cut them all off? No, not necessarily, okay. Um, but that takes a lot of um, energy. It also takes a lot of water, all right? So one of the things like in citrus crops, when they're droughted, or even crops in general, 
they get a really hot spell or they're droughted, what do they do? They drop their um, buds first. They drop their fruit prematurely. Okay, it's because they're trying to re they're trying to um, maintain their water reserves. Okay, so there's sources and sinks. So we got sources that are basically leaves. Younger uh, leaves are more photosynthetically active. Not just the new emerging ones, but ones that are are just younger in general on the branch. Okay. Um, and then also we have storage organs. So you get a large branch, okay, maybe a large root or just a trunk in general. That is a source. Basically, it's not because it's generating energy, but it has stored energy in it. Okay, so kind of like what Kathy was saying, you can cut something back because the roots and the trunk have a lot of energy in it. And if it's the right time of year, it will bud back. Okay, um, but we don't give that advice to novice bonsai people to be pruning back there their junipers or, or pines to nothing, okay? So those are your sources and your sinks are all of these, okay? Fruits, flowers, new leaves, new roots, and callus tissue, okay? Wound repair, all right? So when we want some of this to happen, we have to leave these sources because if we have an area that needs a lot of energy, if we have a large sink, whether it's we just repotted the trees and they are... Um, trying to put on new roots, we got to leave that foliage there. And not only leave the foliage, we got to make sure it gets enough sun to be able to do that, to generate that energy, okay? New leaves, the same deal. Putting on the brand new leaves, those buds as they're emerging, they're not photosynthesizing just yet, okay? They will as soon as they start to get some of that sunlight. But we have to leave those larger leaves on, okay, or those, or those needles to, to allow them to have enough energy, okay? So this is an important thing to, to think about, all right? So this is a principle, um, and you can, the practices vary from candle um, cutting to pinching, not junipers, but certain needle, or certain candles, to uh, defoliation, to partial defoliation, to leaf cutting, branch removal, all of that stuff, okay? Um, so very, very, very interesting. Any questions about energy balance? Mm -hmm. If you cut off Adam's roots, you should cut off Adam's foliage so it doesn't have that amount of foliage to support for this limited climate. Right. Roots. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that fits with this. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't fit with this. And I'm going stick, to stick to my guns on this one. For junipers, particularly, the strength, where does the strength come from, from juni for, with junipers? the foliage, right? How do we know that? Okay. This is what I've learned this from, from Ryan Neal. Um, this is something that he's a, you know, a big firm believer on and for good reason. Okay. Um, but Kathy knows she's been dealing with junipers for, for many, many years. The juniper strength comes from the foliage. How do we know that? Well, we had a juniper here that was nearly dead. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I mean, it wasn't, when you say there wasn't any roots, I went back in and cut, if there were, there was, all the roots were totally gone. I okay. cut new holes up above where there was living tissue and yeah. down, and basically started as a cutting. Yeah. It was a very, very old tree. We wanted this tree. Yeah. And it's now it's, kind of, it's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it was the foliage ah. that kept it going and produced the new roots. The foliage, Okay. And then when they collect these, well, California junipers particularly, and they bring them down from or out of the desert, how much roots do they really have that are viable? I mean, almost nothing. They're pretty much cuttings themselves. Well, how do they survive? So what I'm getting at is that the strength really does come from the foliage. Does that mean that you should leave everything on? Maybe not, okay? But you have to keep that in mind. If you don't leave, leave enough foliage on, that's going to really, you know, uh, be detrimental to the success of that tree, right? If you got, you know, just this huge canopy of foliage, well, you gotta be a little bit practical, right? But the, the strength really does come from the foliage. But what about pines? 
Now this kind of goes into what Kathy was saying about so she can prune back. Yeah. Pines, the power, the strength comes from the roots and the trunk, okay? But the roots. You get a pine with really good roots, you can it's pretty much bulletproof. Man, you'll get some disease here and there, but your strong roots get bullet it's bulletproof. You get a pine that the roots start to suffer, what happens to the pine? It's gone, okay? The same deal. You can get a beautiful uh, pine, collect it from the mountain. Randy Knight has done this many a times and not been able to get a good root system. Toast. Doesn't matter, okay? Doesn't matter what he does to it, missed it, put it in, um, you know, his greenhouse and on a heat bed, whatever. A lot of times it's not going to survive. If that was a juniper, it would survive every time, okay? Um, now, the other thing is you can get a ponderosa pine, and Randy's done this as well, from the mountain, and it's got one branch of foliage, but a big root mass, and it puts on tons of foliage in the, the next year, okay? So that's kind of why, how we know that, right? Just from um, practical experience. But yeah, that's, that's kind of the way it goes. Well, but there is some, you gotta use, you know, some practical knowledge uh, and kind of take a look at how much foliage you have. If you have a lot of foliage, well, are you going to be able to manage the moisture in that foliage or not? Okay, so that's important. All right, water balance in the tree. All right, this is very important. So you have sources and you have sinks. Okay, same deal. What's your source for water? Okay, your roots are your source. Okay, and your sinks for water are leaves, pretty much everything that's growing. Okay, everything that's growing, your fruits, your flowers, your leaves, your new roots. Okay. Um, but there's something that in the science world we call the root to shoot ratio, okay? Now this affects your balance, all right? Now, um, a healthy tree has a very stable root to shoot ratio, okay? And this is why some trees, they suffer in a very shallow pot, okay? Because they need a different ratio or that ratio is off. They don't have as many roots to support the amount of leaves that they have, okay? And it's always gonna suffer, and that water balance is off. Okay, so you may have to reduce the size of the crown, or you may have to just change the size of the pot, right, to give it a little bit more roots. Okay, so this root to shoot ratio is very important. And when we collect a tree um, from the mountain, especially a juniper, and it has very little roots, or even a pine, it has good roots, but very little foliage, okay, we need to actually wait for that root to shoot ratio to kind of, reach equilibrium, that's why we say wait a couple years for it to get healthy. Well, why is the tree healthy? Well, the tree's healthy because it says, well, hey, I got enough roots to put on new leaves. Or it says, I got enough foliage to put on new roots, and I've, I've repaired my roots, and now I can put on new foliage. Okay, so that's why we wait for these Yamadori. We got to wait for this, okay, the energy and that water balance to be just right in the tree, and now we can start to alter things, okay? So that's important, all right? So leaves wilt when there's not enough water, okay? Supply to the leaves. Um, and uh, there's that comment there, turgid, okay? So leaves basically wilt um, when there's not enough water that goes to them, but when they're not wilted, they remain turgid, okay? Very tight, all right? Um, and reasons for why a tree would not be getting enough water, okay? The root to shoot ratio is too low, okay? Could be excess heat, okay? The excess heat can outpace the roots. What does that mean? There's just not enough roots and water available in the soil to meet the demand of evaporation, okay? And then you'll lose that. That's where a shade cloth comes in handy or moving the tree, okay? Um, fertilizer burn, that can also affect the water, okay? Because now you're affecting your osmotic potential in the plant, it becomes saltier outside of the plant than it is inside of the plant, which is a very bad situation because the plant has a lot of salt. So we're, we're full of salt, right? So if it becomes saltier in the pot than in the plant, where does the water like to go? It likes to go where it's least pure, right? Where there's the least amount of water. So if it's saltier in the pot, now water's being pulled out of the plant and then what suffers first? Well, the leaves do because they're at the very end of the chain. So that's the end of the chain receding and you'll get that burn from fertilizer, okay? 
And, but it's just really, it's really just a symptom of lack of water in the leaves, okay? And then also pest damage. So pest damage, such as maybe um, Adele digger aphids, root aphids, okay, they can actually, or a fungi or a bacteria, they can reduce your root mass, and therefore when you get a certain heat or whatever it may be, okay, now you do not have the root system to, um, to shuttle water up to the leaves. Mm -hmm.